Hello. Nice Hi. to see you. Good to see you. And you, yes. How are you? I'm fine, actually. I've, been, uh, I've just been uh, having a look at a book called Minstrel Heart. Oh, really? <laughs> because someone called Rebecca is going to be <laughs> about that. <laughs> is that a good book? Have you been enjoying it? <laughs> well, you know, I have been enjoying it. It's an interesting thing, but um, to look back over your own life in, in print and see that it is eventful, surprising, entertaining, full of uh, amazing people. They can only be described as amazing and uh, events which are one or two of them so fantastic that people find it difficult to credit them. So uh, when you look over that and also realize um, <clears throat> you have been so lucky, you know, in the way that um, apart from, you know, from right from the beginning with your mum and dad and right on through the people you've met, you know, the, um, the I met so many amazing people. And then my love of words was blessed by the poets and writers I knew. And so, uh, yeah. I really uh, can look back over 85 years now. joined today by the wonderful David Campbell. Um, for those of you who might not know who he is, David is a renowned Scottish storyteller who has led an incredibly interesting life and he's kindly agreed to come on to Zoom today to chat about some of the anecdotes in his memoirs, Minstrel Life, A Life and Story, recently published by Lewis Press and I'm sure we'll also get some fascinating insights into storytelling and folklore as well. So I suppose the most logical place to start um, when talking about memoir and storytelling is where it all began. So what do you think really sparked the interest in story that eventually led you to where you are today? Well, it probably started very, very, very early because apparently when I was about three, my mother wasn't very well. My auntie came to visit the house from uh, London and I kept her entertained with um, my reflections and stories and so forth. So I obviously began early. Then when I was at school in Fraserburgh in the Northeast, um, that was a startlingly interesting thing to be. But at age five, I had to learn a new, a new language. I don't know if you know the Doric, but it's our loons and quines and that kind of thing and furry day and how are you doing? But anyhow, um, I had very good teachers and um, they, and I got interested in poems uh, at an early age. And, um, and my uh, mother was a very good storyteller. And um, so, uh, and she was full of mischief as well as being a good storyteller. So I inherited a, both of these characters mainly from my mother. And she really was mischievous. Once she was saying to me, she came home to the house and said, a terrible thing happened to me today. And we were saying, what's that? She said, I was in Woolworth. And so for some strange reason, I put something in my bag I hadn't paid for. And uh, then when I was going out of the shop, these two guards stopped me. And foolishly, I tried to run away, but they pulled me back by the leg, just as I am pulling your legs. And so the whole family is, so mum was fun, you know. The jokes run in the family then. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> One of the aspects that I really loved about your book were the extracts of poetry that you've written across the years. And one that struck me in particular was a poem that you'd written in the shadow of the Cold War. Do you find personally that storytelling and creating art are good ways to cope with some of the unpleasant world events that we all have to go through? 
Yeah, well, it's a strange thing, I suppose, like most uh, people who put their hand to poetry, the, there's a kind of, when I, an emotion is intense, either, uh, you know, the emotions like falling in love or, or desperately falling out of love, or when a desperate events occur, then, you know, you somehow, the intensity of it invites itself to squeeze it into something dense. And so I remember um, being very, very um, upset by Tony Blair and uh, drawing us into these wars and one thing or another. And I wrote um, several satiric poems about, about that and about um, being pulled into the war in that way. And so, um, you know, so that's true. Uh, th these kind of emotions definitely waken something that invites a kind of denser writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something with just a lot more heart behind it. Exactly. And for some reason, uh, that invites, you know, rhythm and... Uh, and sounds to make their play consonances and, and, and sharp staccatonesses and all these things which um, speak a uh, viscerally, you know, they, they're so visceral. And so uh, um, poetry from an early age always attracted me. I remember when I was yeah, just a kid reading Abu Ben Adam, his tribe in Greece, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within his room an angel writing in a book of gold. And Ben Adam said, what writest thou? And he said, the names of all those who Lord, the Lord loves. And Ben Adam said, and am I one? And not, nay, not so, the angel said. And so I was terribly hurt and upset by that until in the next a lines, a the angel returns and lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest because he'd said, well, write me as one who loves his fellow men. So at an early age, even the sense of a, the importance of love was absolutely powerful in me. And I would say, as I say in the book, you know, it has been a kind of ruling force and ruling curiosity in my life, you know, um, to discover the nature of love. And so I've, um, I've had many, many, many loves in my life, um, which some people might think very odd, but I've loved many women and many men with a great intensity. And, um, and of course, uh, I've loved them simultaneously at the same time, which is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes been, of course, the way things are in the world, a, been the cause of uh, several <laughs> great difficulties and even uh, yeah, dark, dark places in my life. So, but it's the, it's that, a quest, I mean, love seems to me also, one way or another, the ruling force in poetry, whether it's the love of landscape, the love of a tree, doesn't matter really. Yeah, you know. it's certainly, I think love is kind of the central golden thread throughout the book, um, especially in the way that you kind of paint the characters of all the people that you meet. You know, they're so rich and you can really see that love shining through in the words. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. I mean, I just need to glance at the a kind of castless of the characters and um, in different ways, you know, I have been so touched and moved by them. And at an early age, you know, I, I was obviously, I think more than most children moved. I remember I was with my dad a, in, <laughs> at a circus and uh, we were watching the circus and at a certain stage, the ringmaster said to the little uh, clown, you're sad, you have to leave, we don't want you. And I was thunderstruck. But then 
he said, as a little man with his floppy trousers and all the rest of it, we can't take kind of world off, you know. The, the ringmaster said, come back. And he said, yes, yes. And he said, whose jacket is that you're wearing? He said, the circus. So he'd take off his jacket, take off his shirt, take off his long panties till he was leftist in these kind of long johns, walking disconsolately. I was in tears, of course, until my father said, listen, David, that will happen again the next time. This just, so he explained it, but it took a lot of, a kind of explaining to me to, um, to uh, you know, recover from that shock of the poor little guy walking away into the dark. <laughs> I think it's that empathy that is so kind of important in storytelling because everyone has a different perspective, so. Yeah, well, in, in storytelling, it is completely a, the empathy and it has to be a kind of empathy with all kinds of people and 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 it's a strange thing that um you know we can inhabit different people i think you know a the first poem i wrote in the book about my <laughs> i don't know if you want to hear it my my pilgrimage it's no, called a man. a man it's called a man held out a promise that he could not keep a promise, hope, illusion that he held, a dream that love could compass all. But his defeat was that it was, as once his father said so long, so long ago, that he was in love with love. And he pursued it all along the decades of his life, tore off deception as a layer of love's onion skin, married truth, thinking this was the golden ring, but found truth was too turn an inquisitor for many fleshes, for it needed wisdom and compassion to find an ounce of worth. And these were mighty companions, not easy to fall in love with, but to be earned by patience and humility. So on he trudged the boy, in love with love, and every meeting was a joy and pain, not one without the other. So he came to know as age came on that all he'd found was still as a rough stone on the shore in need of tides of time to smooth it into something beautiful. And so I really think it's true to find, you know, the, the deep, kind of capacity to empathize with a people of all kinds and that makes understanding possible, then a love is really the total absolute key, you know? Mm. Yeah. Mm. I really love that image of the, the stone taking time to be kind of carved into something beautiful. It's a great image. Yeah. I think you don't really possess a poem that you write, you kind of allow it to appear through you, you know? And um, sometimes, sometimes, as Sorley McLean would say, it comes absolutely automatically and you don't think at all. But I mean, at other <laughs> I love Sorley, but at other times, a, you um, you know, you get most of it, but you think, no, that's not right. And, and that's when you really like, you know, like the nature of love, you have to think and change and look at until it seems to be okay. But um, it's, a, it's such a glorious uh, pursuit. And I really believe, you know, that a, if you're kind of walking in the right path, sounds odd, but I'd really did totally believe in experiencing it, then life comes along to help you, you know? It really does. And so it, it, things happen, events happen, 
people appear, and all these things seem to have a kind of cons consonance eh, when you're kind of, yeah, pursuing the right way and not thinking too much, you know, not yeah. thinking. I mean, I think this question of uh, determination and will are really mistaken uh, ways of trying to live, you know, and they often wrestle the beauty out of things by sort of saying, I will do this. And so you go blindly on and you don't hear the voices. And so uh, I think uh, that's something I seem to have uh, learned one way or another as you roll along, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you illustrated that so perfectly. Um, when you left teaching in the book, you said that there was just an inner voice that told you that it was time to move on. So when I left teaching, a, I didn't know what I was going to do. And my mother, of course, was appalled because I really left. But strange thing happened, you know, destiny rolled along. And I had an interview the last day of term with the BBC because Leslie, the who I was living with at the time, had seen an advertise, an advertisement in the Times Educational Supplement or something and said you should apply for that job. And I think I describe in the book, I was a bit uh, disreputable in these days. We'd had a liquid lunch, you know, got the train through to Glasgow, still a little bit um, merry. And then I thought, God, I haven't even shaved. So I had to go and buy a razor and shaving in the BBC hoping none of the austere looking gents was on the interviewing panel and um, that was that and then it was a story that got me the job and it was a, when Sinclair Aiken who became my boss and one of my greatest and most admired friends he said there is a strange thing there David in in your CV. Um, and I said, oh, yes, it was strange because it was when I was um, just in the last year at school or so uh, that I got involved in a really strange job, which is described very fully in there, where they advertised for um, a prefect's in a kind of itinerant boarding school. And uh, so along I went, the description, description of it was that you were to act as a prefect companion to a 16 year old boy whose health had been damaged by excessive smoking and drinking, which had caused premature aging process. Now I won't read the rest of that, but I, that bit, but the, the result is everyone, everyone swallowed this fact that he seemed to have a, been aged by these things. But, and you might find that, of course, incredible, even less credible when you see the portrait of him as a politician. It's quite remarkable. The whole story is incredible. <laughs> exactly. So anyhow, there we were. A myself and a, um, another a prefect of a, in the school I was in at Harriet, and there we were a, in this sort of boarding school, which is an alien environment to us because we were at a day school a, in Edinburgh. Um, so they, so I'll read this tiny bit. The multiple in identities deployed to authenticate the fantasy were elaborate and skillful. The handwriting of each of the characters in the drama was distinctive because it was populated by a fictitious people. Mike's own, that was Lord Bracken masquerading as a boy, a large open letter scrawl, scrawl. R. Bracken, his uncle's, diminutive, tight and neat. Mr. Greenlees, the lawyer, an indecipherable squiggle appended to typewritten letters, and Mr. Lloyd, who'd been a tutor 
precise and careful appended to a type of the letter. These epistles, of which I have 34, had apparently come from different identities and locations and so forth. So, I mean, the, the elaboration was extraordinary. And, um, but in the end, you know, I, I became a kind of you know, fond of him. And uh, when, when the whole thing was suddenly turned upside down and revealed to be the sham by uh, another tutor that came, a, then, a, then a, it all had to be disbanded. And the next morning I packed, there's the last paragraph, was Mike, or Lord Bracken, <laughs> was standing, was intending to leave after he had seen the household dismantled. When he saw me and two others off in the boat, I couldn't keep tears from my eyes. So strange to have a friend who wasn't who I thought he was, and yet he was a friend, as if we say, by their fruits shall you know them. Because a, not long after that, he left plenty, he left money for my mom to buy a house, and, in, and for my brother's university education and a, bit of, and a bit of mine and so forth. So it was a really, I mean, yeah, it was difficult to believe that particular story. Obviously you've witnessed Scotland come a long way as a nation, um, culturally and politically over your life. Um, but, to what extent do you think artistic and linguistic self-confidence as a nation is tied to our political self-confidence? Greatly. A part of Stuart McGregor's ideal was that it was from a, as in Ireland, you know, it was from the inspiration of the writers and the kind of sense of cultural identity and pride uh, that a, a kind of political force would have its heart's blood. And so a, I think that's really, really important. But I also think in the present day, with the unbelievable media distractions, um, and, you know, and everywhere people's walking about, you know, like this, poking their nose in, um, in, in little gadgets, and doing things I, I don't really know how to do very well. Um, but a, so I think it's difficult. And, I, and I, think, I think, for instance, the rise of the Scottish National Party was a, you know, very amazing and surprising, but it was part of the zeitgeist, you know, that people had this pride and identity because as a, as you or everybody Scottish knows, there's been always this frightening tendency to hide your head and skulk, you know? And I mean, from, and from very dark places, like people being, when I was in the BBC, I would have a, a program for young people. And when we used Scots, then teachers would write in saying, you know, why are you using this guttural English? And we'd be using some, uh, you know, a well, Glasgow Patois or Northeast um, Doric or whatever, whatever. And um, so there's this, if you're ashamed of the, your tongue, the your way you speak, you're finished from the beginning. And of course, that's been a kind of um, linguistic colonialism you know, for a long time, and you. It you is know, so um, sad because Scots is such a kind of expressive language, and I was going to ask as well, um, because of this kind of you know mislabeling it as a as a crude dialect of English, which obviously it is not. Um, a lot of people aren't so in touch with it nowadays, so they struggle to read or understand it, and because of this, on our website, we 
post we tried to post our folklore in English so it's accessible to the widest audience just because there's this yeah. um but do you think that you know recording folk tales in English takes away something from it um Ah, uh, we'll know, Quainy. That's a tricky question, right enough. Well, I think there really is a place for, um, you know, s s Scottish sto uh, stories in, in a kind of Scots. But I, I have to say, if I'm telling stories, because I've been all over the world doing it, a, you won't be understood unless you come to a kind of lingua franca, unless you come to a sort of a, a understandable English. I mean, people will still know from your accent and the rest that you're not English. But um, so I think it's, very difficult, although I think it's important to say, right, here is a story a, in, which, is, which is told by the Scottish traveler and we've just used his language. So it's important to have a, some that don't lose that because, you know, I think it was Lord, who was it that said, a Scottish, who said, when we lose, our language, we lose ourselves. Was that 18th century or so? But I mean, and uh, you know, a, I think it's important that we keep a hold of these things, and that, and that people who say, "Ah, oh, we'll give give a wee give a wee super that that these people are not kind of a belittled in any way that it's it's clear that there's it's really important that they're not seen to or to be in any sense inferior because the most important thing about language is you know is that people communicate with each other and if that's the way they're doing it that works that is you know all that's required but it's a tricky question, actually, yeah. You've obviously been to a lot of places um, and explored a lot of different cultures, folklore, but is there something, what do you think characterises Scottish storytelling specifically and makes it unique? There's something that is um, candid about it that uh, wants to, you know, be on the earth. And, I mean, if you look at great Scottish storytellers like Robert Louis Stevenson, you know, um, then, you know, it's based locally, these best things, and George Mackay Brown, same, you know, and uh, it's sort of earthed in a place and in a culture and with the beliefs behind that culture that uh, are, will, ha will become evident very soon. You know, so they don't belong to a different kind of ethos or a different space or place. Yeah. 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 And I, I would, and I think it is important that we retain a, a place for things which are, which have the kuthi or sharp Scottish words, words which you know, you wouldn't find elsewhere, you know? Yeah, I'm lucky enough to, you know, have had a granny and things like that. I mean, that's a long time ago. <laughs> 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 when people would speak, <laughs> she would speak Scots more, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's still people who, who are, and they, and it, it's very, very refreshing. Mm -hmm. And without that, the other thing is, without that diversity, I mean, uniformity, as George Mackay Brown say, uh, says in many places, you know, a, the kind of everything being the same, same sound, the same everything, 
it, it destroys. If you don't have the diversity, then, uh, you know, it's, if you, I mean, if you didn't, if you couldn't still go to Fraserburgh and hear folk, I'm going out there to tell stories uh, or to take the book because there's things, of course, from my primary school in Fraserburgh when I was there in the second and so on. So uh, if, you, if you go to these places and you can't hear folks still saying, oh, we'll fully in Quiney and all that kind of thing, you know, there's a great poverty in the uniformity. And I think it affects your capacity to think and imagine if you don't have that diversity of a, you know, rhythms and language and words, yeah. I do think it can be difficult because folklore is, you know, so rich and it stretches so far back. Um, it can be difficult to reach younger audiences. And I know personally, the Dundee Storytelling Group really struggles with fresh uptake. So what do you think is the best way to reach these kind of new audiences <coughs> during the continuation of the tradition? Oh, that's really a super question. Um, I think the... I was talking to Claire McNichol the other day, and um, she and I are going to be talking to six new storytellers that Lorna, a Lorna Grieve is fostering. She has a thing called, uh, what's it called? A, oh, I've forgotten the name of her little group. But, um, you know, Claire was saying that she was talking to some very, very young people. And to give, and one of the kids said he would come and, uh, and, um, and s s s speak a little poem. And they should they'd become confident enough to do that. And, it, it, and he was so heartened that people wanted to listen to him. So I think if people, realize that there are listeners, that immediately is helpful, but you have to give them things <clears throat> that will be exciting for people to hear. And that doesn't necessarily mean to say it's got to do with um, spaceships and and Marvel and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, as, you know, it just has to do with uh, touching uh, their feelings at that age. So if you have stories that um, speak to how they're feeling, even if you have to write them or find them or whatever, you know, but make them kind of like spoken stories, you know, mm -hmm. or and hear people's, I mean, if people can be encouraged to tell their own story, that is so fantastic, you know? And, um, you know, I've done a lot of um, storytelling workshops with people of all ages and um, with teenagers, it's a tricky thing. Yeah. The beauty of it, every, everyone has a story to tell. And I think, you know- They do. Yeah, mm. and with folklore, people have always been people and people have always struggled with the same things so the themes are consistent of course absolutely totally yeah 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 the conflicts and the, the loyalties and betrayals and all the rest you know yeah mm -hmm. before we let you go um do you have a favorite folk story that you like to come back to there's a story i love a eh, which is called The Dream Makers. And um, it's, yeah, and a, it's a beautiful story. I think the, I originally found it, usually I hear stories, but I think I found this in a book by Otta S. Swire. And she wrote several books stories from the Hebrides, stories from the Lowlands, stories from blah, blah, blah. And um, this story, yeah, um, 
it's a literary story. Yeah, that's probably one of my total favourite stories. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today, David. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I know there'll be a lot of people following her really excited to uh, hear your insights. So David's memoirs, Minstrel Heart, A Life in Story, is on sale from Lewith Press, who have kindly given us a couple of discount codes for the community to use on their website. Um, so let me get this right. You can use Lewith 2020 for 20% 20 off orders over £20 and Lewith 3050 for 30% off offers over £50. So really? you've a, a good couple of orders there. <laughs> um, yeah. So... Thanks again so much, David, and we'll hopefully get a chance to chat again at some point. So, well, thanks again very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>